So this morning, I would like to take you on a journey back to the distant past before SciPy as a conference started, to the year 2000. And I'd like to start by asking, what is not in this slide? Any ideas? What is not back in the year 2000 in this slide? Any ideas? In the year 2000 bug, any ideas? That's right, package managers. There were no package managers in the year 2000. Instead, what you had was something called the vaults of Parnassus, which was this maze of links that you would navigate and crawl around. And then when you found the thing that kind of did what you wanted, you would read a very short list of very modest instructions about how to install that package. This is the installation instructions for matplotlib around the year 2000. And you would you know, spend not very long, maybe a day or two, installing matplotlib. And so, but it's really cool because you've got free software and it's both free as in beer and free as in freedom and all these wonderful things. But obviously the user experience of downloading and installing such a thing was pretty significant. So how did this affect how projects got developed around this time? Well, if you were a budding project maintainer and you had a good idea for a project, you would start with this modest little code base and then you'd add a little bit more and then you'd add a little bit more, and your project's getting bigger, and it's doing more things. And then as it starts to do enough things, other people might notice your project. And so they come along with the contribution. And because you don't want your users to be forced to read the installation instructions for your project and the installation pro instructions for their project, you decide to just take this contribution. Even though it, it's not quite what you originally intended with your project, it's just so much easier to just take in that extra functionality, whether it's like a little bit outside the bounds or not. So, but this is good. Now your project's doing more things. And because it's doing more things, more people notice. And some of them come along with more ideas too, and they, they have a contribution. And so you take that one as well. And then, wow, you know, things get really popular. You know, a lot of people are using it. A lot of people are going, hey, this is like 90% of what I need, but I need this other little thing. Will you please take this other little thing into your project? And so you do, you take all these things in. But wow, you know, now things are really getting out of control. Uh, some of these contributors that contributed this stuff stick around and they're helping you fix bugs. If a user has a problem, they'll help them through it. But you know, for some of these contributors, you know, life intervenes. And they get busy, they go off, and they do other things. There's no shame in that. It happens to everybody, myself included. But the net result is this ragtag band of contributors that you have to your project um, are, are now just keeping all of these things going. And the worst of it is you only partially understand what all of these things do because you didn't even write them in the first place. And they aren't really part of you know, the core goals of your project in the first place. This is what's often described as the free as in puppy problem, right? These contributions are like puppies. Everybody loves puppies, they're really great. But they're not really free, right? Like, this is my puppy Olive, and of course, you know, if you're not careful, you come home and you find that she's destroyed all the couch cushions, and you know, they, but puppies have a cost, so you have to be careful about having too many puppies. So, what's the solution? Well, we have to somehow reduce the burden and complexity on project maintainers or they'll just burn out, right? And interestingly, one of the big unlocks here over the past 23 years, since the year 2000, has been package managers. If you can get everything down to just pip install my project or conda install or mamba install, it doesn't really matter, but if you can get it down to kind of a one line easy thing to do, there's all kinds of things that come out of that. And I don't want to claim here at SciPy that Python packaging is perfect because I know many of you struggle with it all the time and it's an ongoing, uh, you know, it's an ongoing effort to make it better, but we are light years ahead from where we were in the year 2000. Um, thanks to all this work from a lot of people in this room on the package managers, also on the packages themselves. So what this unlocks as a maintainer is that you can take your project and split it out. So you have like a core bit of functionality 
that's really important and then have like the satellite projects that do the more specific, you know, more, more malleable functionality, right? This is exactly what SciPy's SciKits are all about, right? That's why that effort started. Matplotlib is currently, uh, has a grant application to do the same thing for Matplotlib and pull some of that functionality out of the core. Uh, recently, CPython had what was called the dead batteries pep, where they went through the standard library and they figured out, hey, these things, they don't really belong in the core anymore, let's spin them out and make them their own project. And so, I think it's interesting to look at why this has happened so many times with so many different projects and why it actually helps. Because intuitively, it, it does sort of seem like having multiple things should actually be harder to maintain than having one thing. Um, and I think some of the answer to that question lies in this fantastic book about open source development. It's called uh, Working in Public by Nadia Eggball. One of the things that makes this book so great is that it's a study of open source projects in practice and how they actually work. It's not just sort of an abstract idea of how people think, you know, how one person thinks it should work. That's what opening keynotes at SciPy are for. Um, and if you want to hear more of this kind of study of open source project, there is a talk later today by Amanda Kasari that looks really interesting. Um, but this book sort of describes how users become contributors and also defines contributor rather broadly. It's not just people that contribute code, but it's all these other things, issue triage, documentation, project management, event planning, promotion, all these things. All of this, if you do any of these things, you're a contributor. Um, but one of the key insights in this book is that if you compare how the contributors grow in a project to how the users grow in a project, you can actually classify projects into a few different types. Um, the two most important for this talk are federations and clubs. So uh, federations have very high user growth. They're very popular projects, but they also have very high contributor growth. This is kind of like the, the classic bizarre promise of open source that everybody, every open source project users could also become contributors. But in reality, it's actually pretty rare um, this tends to be the really big ones, like Linux. One could argue that CPython is almost a federation. Um, and federations, because they have a, such a large contributor base, they tend to have a lot of structure, like governing bodies, working groups, just to handle that scale, because you can't really get a thousand people in a room talking all at once and, and expect anything to happen. Um, so that structure is really, really important but it does add some overhead and it adds barriers to entry for new contributors. On the other hand, clubs have relatively low user growth. So they're not like super popular, but, like, but a significant fraction of those users become contributors. An example here would be something like AstroPy, which is a collection of astronomy specific functionality and therefore is kind of limited to that small but super enthusiastic group of astronomers, I know there's some back there. Um, and because its users tend to be so motivated and engaged, many of them become contributors. But because that scale is smaller, it doesn't have that same overhead that a federation would have. And then lastly, there's these two other types. Toys are sort of like little personal projects that maybe a few other people are interested in, but really it's just kind of a one person show. And then stadiums are interesting because they have like massive user bases, but a very limited contributor base. Um, it's something like these tend to be sort of corporate controlled open source projects, something like Google Chromium. Even I would argue Firefox is trending from a federation into a stadium these days. Um, but let's get back to the model in which large projects get split up. So you, know, you have this core project, and it's a position where, where it's supporting many, many people. And it has a bunch of legacy considerations, and therefore becomes very conservative to change. On the other hand, these satellite projects uh, are behaving more like clubs than they're behaving like federations. And therefore, there's, en there's less for any one person to have to understand to show up and start contributing to them you can move faster without breaking things in these little satellite projects. And you can even kind of have more robust competition in this space, different projects that do kind of the same thing but in a different way and sort of you know, let the best ideas kind of win out. 
And so in short, these satellite projects are where innovation ends up happening. But on the downside, what's really happened here is that a large part of the work of doing open source has moved from just like building a thing to designing all the interfaces that enable the creation of a bunch of things. Or to put it another way, like sort of it becomes about scaling up an ecosystem. And whereas in the old model, you could imagine a bunch of people just going in a room and closing a door and coming out with, with code and software, which is never really how it works, to be clear. Uh, in the new model, it's the, the collaboration between the projects and building the most inclusive community become the whole point of the work. So I would argue that this is kind of a significant sh paradigm shift in how open source scientific software has been developed over the past 10 years or so, from thinking of these big monolithic projects into sort of this ecosystem with all these loosely connected things, right? And as you scale this up, you see that what we're actually building is this network of loosely coupled projects. And very specifically, this is kind of what our community looks like. Apologies if your project hasn't made it to this slide yet. There's new things all the time that really should be here. But you, generally speaking, you have like Python at the core, then you have these kind of core scientific projects at the next layer out. And then as you go out, things get more domain specific, they get smaller, they get more agile. And, and that's kind of where we have landed as a community. And it, when you, when you add up the number of contributors to all of these things, it is just this massive number of contributors that if it was all still under the, envelop, you know, under the umbrella of a single project would be really hard to manage. And so to me, this kind of brings to mind Metcalfe's law, which many of, may, many of you may have heard of, which is the value of a network is proportional to the square of its nodes. And this is often cited to like explain the stickiness of social networks, you know, as Facebook gets more and more users, it's more and more valuable to the people that are there and the people that come. And definitely, I think this has happened to this community in that like people come to this community and they stick to this community because of this network of projects and the breadth and, and you know, this critical mass that we've, we've developed here. Um, but from a maintainer's perspective, it's these edges that matter and the connections between them because they're costly. They're, they require this communication between the projects. So I would argue that actually the corollary here is also really important, which is that the cost of a network is proportional to the square of its edges. So somehow we have to like reduce the cost of these edges or make them more efficient, I think, in order to make the whole process more effective. And this relates pretty directly to a pretty old idea in software engineering from the mythical man month. Um, one of its core concepts is that as projects get more complex and more and more behind schedule, just adding more people doesn't help because the communication overhead starts to take over. Um, I think a lot has changed since 1975. I mean, for one, hopefully we wouldn't use this title today, um, but also, we have much better tools for asynchronous collaboration, like things like GitHub or GitLab, like really chip away at those communication overheads. We have these ways of like communicating across the planet in real time or asynchronously or whatever that are actually pretty, pretty darn good and miles ahead of what people were thinking of at the time. But even these greatest communication and project management tools can't design how these projects need to connect. That, I think, is still very much the human pursuit and the work. Um, so let's zoom in a bit now about how these projects actually connect. On a technical level, of course, it's APIs, application programming interfaces. This is how these projects need to connect. And I would say that um, APIs are rather full of puppies a lot of the time as well. And we need to be very careful about puppies in APIs. Um, it's very easy as a designer of an API to just add that one more thing that helps that niche use case and helps one of your users. And then the downside is you're stuck maintaining that API forever. Like APIs are really the Hotel California of software engineering. Once you put them in, you can never ever get them out. And so you have to be very, very conservative about the new things you add all the time. And I think the goal is really to design an API that 
is as expressive as possible and meeting the needs of as many of you, your users as possible, while also not limiting your ability to evolve and change. And that's just a really hard problem, and I don't think I have any silver bullets to, to share. But one suggestion I do have is you want to design APIs based on an observation of needs that you see in the real world, rather than an imagination of future needs. Um, this is much like where if you're designing a university campus and you you want to figure out where to build the paths, you kind of like wait for people to wear out the paths and then you go back and you pave those. It's that classic sort of thing. Um, so let's take C Python as an example. That's something I work on now, which has a Python C API and look at how different projects use it um, for comparison's sake. So something like matplotlib has a fairly classic use of the Python C API, and therefore there's not a ton of problems that you run into as either of all. So Matplotlib's not using a huge amount of the API, it's using it in sort of the intended ways, and so C Python is free to change things and it doesn't tend to break Matplotlib very often. A project like Cython, on the other hand, which is kind of a whole new programming language to connect Python to C, you ends up using the entire CPython API and even paints outside of the edges a little bit. And so every time CPython makes some sort of, you know, minor change to its API, it's very likely to break Cython. And so there's a lot of communication that happens, has to happen between these two projects. And then there's projects like Greenlit, uh, which is something that adds coroutines to Python in a very sort of efficient way is actually kind of making an end run around the Python C API entirely. So it's doing things the API was never intended for. And therefore, it breaks all the time. And when it breaks, it breaks in ways that are very hard and expensive to fix and require a lot of collaboration. Um, and so all of this is an art and not a science. And you just have to kind of pay attention to what your users are doing and, and use that as feedback to know where to go next. Um, and then lastly, there are projects for which the API is just fundamentally so, uh, so uh, you know, unfitted for that the projects are forced to fork your project so that they can change it in ways that the API doesn't even allow. So something like Cinder, which is a JIT uh, out of Meta, had to do this. They had to actually fork CPython to do what they're doing. And now we're going through the work of figuring out what are those new API surfaces they need so that they no longer have to fork. Because forks, well, they're a very strong signal of where your project needs to go, are you know, often, oftentimes not long-term sustainable. And so if you can magically do this very hard work and figure out where the API should be and have this nice, well-designed, specced, and limited API, there's this really powerful side benefit you get, which is you can take that API and have multiple projects implement the same API. So this is exactly what's happening with the Consortium for Python Data API Standards, which um, is sort of using the API that NumPy has as a starting point and standardizing it so that different libraries could implement it. And then as a user, if you need like regular CPU compute, you can keep using NumPy. But if you need GPU compute, you might use something else. If you need distributed compute, you, need, you might use something else. And this is all sort of made possible by standardizing these APIs. Um, there is a talk on this on Thursday. I think it's on Thursday. Maybe it's Friday. Friday. It's Friday. Um, and likewise, in, in CPython itself, there's the HPy project, which is standardizing an API layer on top of CPython that will let you write an extension for CPython that will also work with PyPy or GraalPy or other implementations. And you know, interestingly, because I used to work at Mozilla, this is, of course, also what made the web so powerful, right? We have all these web standards, and then you can have, you know, a dozen different web browsers that can, can communicate with millions of different websites, and it all kinds of works because we have these API standards in the middle. So to back up again, um, we want to make contributors more effective and encourage more of them, and we want smaller, more agile projects with these well-defined APIs. But these contributors, of course, have to come from somewhere. And the most obvious path is that users have an easy on-ramp to becoming contributors. 
Um, there's a lot of barriers to that, like conversion from users to contributors. Some are technical, some are economic, some are social, and I certainly can't get to all of them in this talk. But I'd like to focus on one technical problem and then one social problem. Um, and the technical problem to me seems pretty Python specific. I can't imagine giving it at like another language community's uh, conference. And the technical problem is that the main projects in our community are not really Python projects. Um, it's really sort of interesting. If you take them and you just graph the number of lines of code that are Python and not Python, you know, something like NumPy is mostly not Python, right? And of course, this is done for performance, and it's done to, to you know, better utilize hardware, essentially. Um, but what it means is when you have a contribution, there's this extra hurdle. So someone would have to learn another language in order to make a contribution to NumPy. And therefore, some contributions just kind of never make it. Um, this is referred to as the two language problem, right? And I, I actually believe that anyone with sufficient motivation and time could get there. There's nothing magical about learning C, and everyone in this community is very bright. Um, but you know, with time and incentives in such short supply and the fact that people are here because they used Python and they got very proficient at Python, you know, we're much more likely to get contributions in Python as well. And I do sort of wonder, like, what, how many contributions are we losing out on because of this problem? Um, there are plenty of people in projects that have worked on this problem over the years. You know, so like Cython is kind of this bridge language which sits between Python and C, so you don't have to quite learn all of C in order to connect it to Python. Things like Numba, you know, gets your Python code faster, so maybe you're less likely to need to jump into C. Uh, Mojo is pretty recent. I think it's too early to say where that goes, but it is clearly inspired by this two language problem and going at it as well. So there have been a lot of these kinds of things over the years, and I feel like we're still not quite there. Um, another way to look at this is uh, someone, and I'm sorry I couldn't track down who said it originally, is that Python is the second best language for everything, right? So I've drawn, drawn this like very, uh, very formal, very scientific graph where I have Python here and the things on the x-axis, right? And other languages you know, are more peaky and they're good at you know, one or two things, but Python is the second best at everything, right? Um, so things that have tried to make Python better at things in the past generally you know, might make it better at, at one thing, say performance, at the expense of something else, usually maybe like developer productivity or ease of use or something like that. Um, it's very hard to imagine kind of pushing that line straight up. Um, there have been some interesting exceptions to this, so like PyDyed, which brings Python to web browsers, kind of made it a little better in this one little niche use case of being in a web browser. Um, the faster C Python project that I work on now is increasing the, the suitability of Python to more domains just simply by making it faster but without changing the semantics of the language. Um, so this is somewhat an acknowledgement that the current set of trade-offs is actually really useful and changing them would be extremely disruptive. But I think it's unlikely that this will ever lead to, to Python becoming the first best at everything or even maybe the first best at anything. And I don't think that that's really the point because Python's strength, I think, is that it goes broad and not deep, right? And you see this in the numbers, in that Python's growth is just sort of, you know, way shooting above everything else. And I think it's because it, it really is the second best language for everything. Um, and that's not something we would want to lose, even while trying to get better and solve this two language problem. But I think perhaps there's a new solution to the two language problem that at least we should be looking at and thinking about. Um, I was reluctant to say anything at all about ML and LLMs in this talk, um, 
mainly it's like extremely fast moving. If I wrote the talk this morning, it would already be obsolete by this afternoon. And so I don't want to talk about things like that. I want to like at least make this talk last a couple weeks. Um, <laughs> but also like a lot of what you see in when people talk about LLMs still is look at this one trick that really worked for me. Or they'll say like, look at how funny it is that it completely fails at this. Like, I don't know how useful that is because it's not generalizable. But one thing that I think is generalizable if you look at you know, how they work and where they come from is in language translation. Because of course, these LLMs began life kind of as natural language translation. And that a lot of those techniques and processes have now moved into generative AI. But it's sort of the same thing. And so you can ask a question like, can you translate this Python into faster C for me? Um, and I certainly wouldn't trust the output. In fact, again, I said I wouldn't do this. The few times I've tried this, sometimes it hilariously fails and gets it completely wrong. And you have to have some context and knowledge of C to even understand that. Um, but it certainly, it, it makes it faster and it, it, gets, you the, it gets you there sooner. Um, but I think it's also really important for this community to highlight how this would work if this is an idea that takes off. So, as you, you probably know, you know, all these LLMs, they get tr trained on data sets. And in this case, they're trained on open source code, much of which was written by people in this room, right? So even if you're not an ML engineer, you have probably contributed to GitHub Copilot through your code contributions, and that has made it into the model. So these, you know, open source code goes into the model, and then it's able, of course, to spit out generated thing, you know, your Python translated to C. Um, but I, I think this creates a bunch of problems we're going to need to grapple with. Like, one is just sort of the intellectual property ramifications of this. And I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not even going to go there. Um, another is that it tends to generate solutions that are very popular, maybe not best practice or maybe not the most recent. We already see this where Copilot does a good job sort of generating Python 3.7, which is already out of you know, end of life, but does a pretty bad job generating more recent kinds of Python. And another thing we know is that as LLMs start, you know, start to be in a closed system and generated data starts to infect the model, you pretty quickly lead to what's called model collapse and, and you, you get garbage out. And so the LLMs are going to need sort of a thriving, living, and robust open source ecosystem just in order to continue to exist. And for that reason, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're not all just going to be writing you know, code with LLMs anytime soon, because we need to find sort of an equilibrium and a balance uh, between these things. So now that I've made the long journey from the early 2000s all the way into the future that we have with generative AI, um, I think it's as good a time to point out that behind all of these projects that I've been talking about in the abstract are people. And you know, people, of course, are, are interesting. They're different from projects. They need you know, to put food in their mouths and a roof over their heads. And with contributions to open source, of course, there isn't always this direct correlation between the work and the money that you earn for that work. And nor would I argue, there, does there need to be? I mean, one of the great things about open source is that it's not explicitly transactional. But um, you know, for those of us that get paid to work on open source, there can often be this very convoluted path between uh, you know, contributions that you make to the project and revenue for your company. And that might make sense to the current set of executives, but might not make sense to the next set of executives. So it's always very tenuous. And you know, other times, open source is just procrastination driven. You, you constantly hear the story that like, I was working on my PhD and ended up writing Matplotlib instead. Um, <laughs> that's not me. That was John Hunter. <laughs> um, but you know, or you know, it's, it's work that is in the process of building experience and reputation to lead to revenue at some point in the future, right? And I think it's important to note that that option to sort of delay or forego remuneration for this work is a privilege. Um, it's akin to like an unpaid internship, right? So it's not a level playing field. Some of us have that privilege to do that, and others of us don't. 
Um, and so I think for those of us in a position to make a change in this space, we should be constantly looking for ways to support our contributors wherever they are and for the reasons that they're coming. Um, you know, so I think one of the like low cost things that all maintainers can do is actively learn why their contributors are showing up. Um, find ways to meet them where they are, find out what motivates them and what would be helpful to them. Um, I've seen this great trend of projects moving from like email forums to more real-time things like Slack and then to regular video meetings. And I think at each step of the way, you're seeing more of the whole person. And that's really very, very important to sort of understanding that these con contributions aren't just things that show up in a PR. They are coming from people. Um, and of course, you know, some potential users that can become contributors, you never hear from at all because they don't even feel comfortable coming to your spaces. Um, I think codes of conduct are pretty obligatory at this point, and they've certainly been talked about at this conference, but they require active enforcement and transparency in order to be effective. And I think we're still all learning the best practices to implement them. They're absolutely necessary because, you know, if any person doesn't feel safe in your space, that represents many, many good ideas that you're just missing out on. And I also want to say, like, that as we join here in beautiful, hot Austin, Texas, um, that there are people who may not be comfortable coming to Texas right now, given recent political changes. These sorts of things are very easy, are very easy to miss if you're not sort of aware of them. And I think the, the SciPy organizers are doing an excellent job with hybrid and with looking at new venues and, and all of these things and thinking about you know, where, where's the most inclusive um, structure that, that, we can, that we can create. Um, so to sum up, as we've all joined here this week, let's get to it. We have all this work, all this connective tissue we need to build between our projects and what better time and place to do it than here while we're all gathered together, you know, both physically and virtually. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> so let's get to know each other. Let's get to know who's here, why we're here, and build this engine to power the next wave of amazing scientific discoveries. Thank you very much. You can post them on Slack, or I'll have a microphone that works in one second. And Jim has another one. Hello, hello. Cool. Any questions in the room? If not, I'll start one to get you ready. Um, so I really like the discussion about the API and like the surface area. How do you think, you and your team, mm -hmm. think about the trade-off between enabling more people, increasing the area, and the increasing the learning, the barrier of learning about that API? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think, like talking about CPython specifically, one of one of the things about its API is it's inconsistent in certain ways that that uh, makes it harder for people to learn because they might learn one part of it and that learning doesn't apply to another part of it. And people are working on making that more consistent. But unfortunately, back to my Hotel California point, it's really hard actually to build that consistency because you're going to break somebody. And so to a certain extent, there's certain breakages that we're always going to be stuck with. And therefore, um, you know, education and documentation probably does become the best solution to some of that stuff. Um, yeah, we're definitely in this, this existential moment in CPython right now where there, whether we continue to evolve that API gradually, or whether we just make a clean cut and you know, start a new one from scratch. And it may actually be the, the latter, though it seems like more work, maybe less work. Hey, Mike, great talk. Um, what motivated you to do Pyodide? Because looking at it now, it's a very, it, it, back when it started, it, it may not have been as popular or as relevant as it is now, but I'm curious what 
made you have the foresight or to approach it then? Um, so at the time, I was at Mozilla, and we were actually developing sort of an in-house data science notebook-like thing, but rather different from Jupyter Lab, but, but in a similar space. And one of, its, one of its design principles was there didn't have to be a back end, that the, all the data science would happen in the browser. And so it started out as this JavaScript tool where you have to write JavaScript. And of course, that's not what many of our data scientists were familiar with. They wanted to have Python. And so um, because I was at Mozilla, and of course we had WebAssembly came out of there, we talked to the WebAssembly team, and they sort of said, actually, it wouldn't be that hard if you just compile the entire C Python and all of, and NumPy and everything and just put it in the browser. And I thought it was crazy. Um, but they told me it would be easy. And so <laughs> I believed them. And it wasn't, it, it turned out to be somewhere in the middle. <laughs> it was harder than they thought and easier than I thought. And, um, you know, and I think we also did have a bit of a, a mandate at the time of like what, what new things can be done with browsers and how can we push the edges of it in a way that maybe Google wouldn't go in to, to sort of differentiate ourselves. Um, and of course, it ended up being a tool that works on all browsers, but. Cool, thank you. Um, we're a little bit short on time. So uh, if you have questions, Mike will be around. You can corner him. He's on Slack. There's also a keynote uh, channel on Slack where you can ask questions where I'm sure Mike will scan maybe or I'll, I'll make him scan it or something. So thank you, Mike. This was a great talk. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.